W-A-K-Y. Joe, what is the magic of why? Why are we here? That's a great question. The magic of Wacky is really an attitude. I think that's the thing that, that is so special about it. And we were talking earlier tonight about John Randolph. He really was, is the straw that stirs the drink here. He, he did create an attitude. If you think about it, it's an enormous challenge to be able to manage so many creative people. I mean, these guys were very creative, but also, you know, very, very strong personalities. And I didn't do well with authority at some times, and you know, they, they, had, they had their own issues, and John was able to bring them all together and, and really make it up, really make it a fun thing and, and transmit that fun to those of us who listened on the air. I, I'm one of, of dozens of, of kids who grew up listening to Wacky, and, and it was just so infectious and so, so special that I just had to be, you know, in the radio business because it was larger than life, and, and I think John and Coyote and Gary Burbank and Dude Walker and all of those guys really made that happen for me. What, uh, now you worked for Wacky. What year did you start? I was there in the last days of Wacky and Wacky really was, was barely Wacky at the end but I was there from late 83 until they blew the station up in August of 1986. And what was it like that last night? Wacky? You know, actually, it was it was really sort of a it was it was, it was kind of melancholy. We um, we knew that the station was going beautiful music. If you can believe that, beautiful music on AM. They they had told us earlier in the week, and we had a special night, and all the jocks came in, and we you know we played some music and played some requests and told people this was the end. And we called John Randolph about an hour into the show, and John drove up from Danville, and we all sort of sat around and told stories and reminisced about the old times, but. Really, more than that, I think it was it, it was kind of sad because it was the passing of, of such an incredible era for all of us. And when they when they threw the switch at midnight, we all just sat there. It was it was very quiet after midnight. We sat there for 10 or 15 minutes. Nobody wanted the night to end. Nobody wanted to go home. It was it was kind of a tough realization for everybody that you know we had really reached the end of the road. What was the format at that time? That you were there? We were an oldie station. We uh, we tried to capitalize on the on the fun, loving, wacky uh, attitude that John had had and that, that John had established, and so we played a lot of uh, a lot of music, really from the '60s and '70s, some music from the '50s, and you know a lot of a lot of black artists and the Beatles and that type of thing. But it was it was pretty much an oldie station with uh, trying to uh, to do a lot of local contest and listener involvement and that type of thing. AM radio has been through a lot of changes, but back then in the 60s and 70s, it, it, was, it was a powerful medium. Why do you think that was? Well, you know, it's really interesting. There were, there were stations who had FMs and had no idea what to do with them. Very few people were listening to FM radio. In fact, it really wasn't until the 70s that FM got established, and radio companies saw FMs as throwaways. AM was really the sort of the medium of choice, and it, I don't know. I think radio was it was a it was a very different time. You know, we we didn't have the internet and the narrow casting that we have now. I mean, what we had then was sort of a small window in time when everybody watched the same TV programs. We had three or four, uh, you know, channel selections during the during that time, so everybody watched the same shows. And we had I don't know 10, 12 radio stations. And so everybody was listening to essentially the same radio stations and, and AM especially with, you know, oftentimes in the car, it's the kids who make the decision about the radio. You know, they mom and dad are, are okay to keep the kids happy. So that's why Wacky and WKLO had just the phenomenal shares that it did. Of course, as we got into the mid-1970s, once, once kids heard that stereo high-fidelity sound, and once they became affordable, once you could buy your little Pioneer stereo AM FM tuner with a pair of speakers for 150, 200 bucks, it was over for, for AM music. What was the first time you talked to Johnny? Uh, Johnny Randolph. You know, I, I called John, I think I had talked to him a couple of times, just asking him about various programming things. I was one of those kids who just wanted to be on the radio, wanted to know everything about the radio, anything I could do to, to, to get close to the radio, I would do it. And, and when I was about 14, I called John up and, and just asked him some questions and, and said that I really wanted to be in the business and asked him how things work. And he was very patient with me. He spent some time with me. 
And in fact, he uh, he came out to our school and spent about a. We had a little radio station out there at the uh, at the school for the blind. That he came out to our our school and stayed with us for about 45 minutes, answered our questions, uh, sort of you know watched our look, looked at our little radio station and that type of thing. And it was. I know we had a thousand other things to do, but it absolutely. You know, it, it made my year and to have to have John come out was was just terrific. But that's the that's really the first time I had talked to him, and he doesn't he obviously doesn't remember this because you know there are so many so many people that he talks to. But I've had a chance to catch up with him over the years and really find John to be one of the most common sense programming guys I've ever dealt with. Uh, now, just a couple of questions, just a few sentences on on what I say. This is kind of like a narrative. Okay. Uh, Program director. What is the program director? The program director is the person who really sets the tone for the radio station. He's responsible, he or she is responsible for everything that goes out over the air. But more importantly, they're responsible for setting the tone, the pace of the radio station, and making sure that everybody is moving in the same direction. What's a, what makes a good DJ? That's a great question. Um, I think what makes a good DJ is the ability to communicate with people. The difference between being a talker and being a communicator, to, to, to sort of understand where people are and reach them where they live. I think it's a, I think it's a real challenge. Some people, you know, I've been asked if, if good jocks are born or made. I think the answer is probably a little bit of both, but there is a, there is, there is a lot of, of inherent qualities to this. I think if you, if you don't, if you don't have it, I'm not sure that, that you can you can make it better. But I'm not sure you can really you can really learn it. Um, I think you have to really have the ability to sort of reach people where they live, be interested in people, and and, and be able to to, uh, to talk to them about the things that they're interested in. What are the good things and the bad things, just shortly, of being a, 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 a DJ? Um, the bad things about being a DJ, I haven't found too many of those. I, I really enjoy it. I, I think, uh, you know, I always joke that I never got into this business to make a lot of money, and boy, that's worked out real well. You know, I, I think that's <laughs> that's still uh, that's still a push for for most of us. We'd all like to be making more money, but um, it is a, uh, you know, I, I I really feel like in my in my current job, in fact, doing a talk show, I've got a license to steal. They don't let me steal a lot, but they do let me steal at, uh, at Clear Channel. So I really have very few negative things to say about about being a DJ or being a talk show host. I think it's it's just an incredible amount of fun. Okay. Okay, Kevin. Thanks. Wait, is there any anything else you'd like to say about? No, not really. Is it? I mean, is there, did that give you some of what you wanted? Or absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm just really glad they did the tribute to John because, uh, I mean, he really, you hear about the personalities all the time, but, I mean, if you think about it, it is a hell of a challenge to manage all those people. It is a job. That station today is, is really special, right? I mean, we look back on it during the 60s and 70s, and it's a special time in World War II. Well, I think that's true, but you know, radio is so much, especially more, more then than it is now. The, we, the corporate, the corporatization of radio has changed it somewhat, but radio was so much about larger-than-life personalities in those days, and about big egos and, and all those kind of things. And to be able to get, to harness all of that talent and getting it all going in the same direction, you know, I, I think people don't understand what a what a real challenge, what a real talent that is. Uh, what do you think the future of radio is? You know, it, it's interesting. I, I, um, I'm really concerned about the future of, of some radio. I just read where the folks at Apple have struck a deal with GM and Ford and Lexus and other folks to put docking stations, iPod docking stations in the cars. I, I think for stations like the one where I work at WHAS, as long as we're connecting with the community, you know, if we can, if we can give you some some content, tell you about things that are going on in your life, give you information that you don't have, and give it to you immediately, I think we're going to be okay. I, I really, I, I don't know about the about the music stations. I think they face some real challenges, and I think there's, I think there's obviously still a place for them. But I think the the music stations will have to redefine themselves. Uh, and one more thing. Of course, radio is a mass medium, but what's a, uh, 
What makes it different from, say, TV or radio or the internet? Radio is radio is so much more intimate than television. You know, television, you can glitz it up, you can do so many things. On radio, I do a talk show, if people listen to me three hours a night, they really know who I am. If, if they listen to me for a period of time, and it, you know, that's a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's a little scary sometimes, uh, you know, how much people know you because you have to leave so much of yourself out there. If, if, you, if you're doing it right, radio is just such an intimate medium because you come into people's bedrooms, their cars, their bathrooms, their kitchens. I mean, you're just with them everywhere, and there's really this sense that they that they know you. And on television, you know, it's not quite the same because generally you have an audience, or you have you have special effects, or you have any number of things. So that there's a there's an intimacy, a one-to-one -one quality about radio that I think is is unmatched by any other medium. Do you think it's because that people listen, usually listen to radio when they're alone? I think that's that's a lot of it. They listen to radio when they're alone, or when they're excuse me, maybe when there was somebody else. Um, but you know, that's one of the things that you sort of learn early in this business, is that if you if you have 10,000 listeners, you really don't have an audience of 10,000. You have an audience of, you have maybe 5,000 audiences of two people, or you have 10,000 audiences of one person. And you really sort of need to, to to think about it in those terms, that it's, as I say, it's such, a, it's such an intimate medium that, that you do have a chance to really make a connection with people, especially if they listen to you over a long period of time.